Hey dudes, Hardcore Kid here. Hey, it's Halloween season once again, and you know what that means. Oh yes. Time to go back to Elm Street and... What? What? But I always review a Nightmare on Elm Street movie every Halloween. What are you... Really? We're not doing them anymore? <sighs> Alright. Well, what are we reviewing this year? Oh crap. Looks like we're not going to be doing any Nightmare on Elm Street films this year. Instead, we're going to be looking at something different. Does that mean I don't need to wear this fedora anymore? Nah, I'm keeping it on. Looks cool. Now, let's talk about the ghost that just about everybody refers to as Casper. Now, Casper was first born, or should I say, first deceased, in a 1939 book and 1945 famous studio short, both entitled The Friendly Ghost. Unlike most other spooks and specters that roam the horror-themed lands of fiction, Casper isn't scary or threatening. Just like his namesake, he's a friendly and down-to-earth ghost who wants to fit in with everybody, despite looking pale, bald, and, well, dead. Unfortunately, all the people, or all the fleshies as they're sometimes referred to, end up getting scared by him, and they all run away to save their skin. For the next several decades, Casper would continue to roam throughout various shorts, before finally getting his own live-action movie in 1995. I know a few people who kind of hate this movie, but I really enjoyed it. It had some creativity, fun characters, and good CGI effects for its time. Plus, it starred Christina Ritchie, who was pretty cute before she grew up to become Jillian Smurf. Of course, one live-action movie wasn't enough for the friendly ghost. So in 1997, a prequel was made entitled Casper, A Spirited Beginning. Yeah, a prequel. A sequel wasn't shitty enough for you? Want to know what happens to Casper when he first becomes a ghost? Okay then, here you go. But is this movie really bad, or is there actually some good to it? Well... Let's find out. This is Casper, a spirited beginning. Roll the footage! The movie begins on the railroad to CGI Loween Town. Holy shit! Well, the movie certainly starts promising. That is, until we slide into one of the train's coaches, and we see our main character Casper on board with several other ghosts. And all I can say is, dear lord, these ghost models are hideous. I'm not talking about the designs, the designs are cool, but the actual mechanics of them. Compare them to the first movie where the ghosts moved rather smooth and had a rather soft and mysterious look to them. Here they look stiff, jerky, and tacked on. The only solace about the CGI? It's not as bad as Video Brinquedos, and that came out like a decade later. So the douchebag passengers end up throwing Casper out of the train, where he suddenly teleports into a place called Deedstown. Oh, hey, look! It's Ben Stein! He was in the first movie, and now he's a fruit vendor for some reason. Pardon me, sir. I'm new here and... Well, welcome to Deedstown, Sonny. <laughs> Alright, I'll give the movie a bit of credit. That has to be the very first time I've ever heard Ben Stein scream. <laughs> awesome. What's not awesome are the reactions to the rest of the townspeople seeing a supernatural specter floating around their town, which makes them do really cartoonish things like running into people, climbing up flagpoles, and all that shiz. Me? I'm no ghost. My feet! I am the ghost! 
So now we meet our other protagonist. Gone are Christina Ritchie and Bill Pullman, and instead we have Chris Carson, played by Brendan Ryan Barrett, and his dad, played by Steve Gutenberg, wearing a fake goatee. Ah yes, Steve Gutenberg, the guy who just loves playing those boring, whiny doofuses in just about every role he's in. If you like, you can put your hands around my waist. The guy is so uncharismatic, he makes Charlie Day look like Daniel Day-Lewis. And that's stretching it thin. Anyway, just like Pullman, Gutenberg is a single dad, who always has little to no time for his son. He works as a building contractor looking to tear down a big house called the Applegate Mansion, which, by the by, is not the same house we saw in the first movie, in order to make room for a new mini-mall. But as it turns out, the entire town are protesting against the demolition because they consider it a historic landmark, being that it's the home of the Applegates, the family that founded the town. Leading the mob is Sheila Fistograph, played by Lori Lowlin, who stands right in front of Gutenberg and puts his phony face rug in his place. This house survived the decades, and we'll make sure it survives you. Look, lady, I mean, cut me some slack. This place is falling apart. The best thing we can do is replace it with something useful. Like what? Another burger stand? Not another burger stand! Stop the building, make them in. If these people aren't interested in getting a shopping center installed in their town, then is there really any point in the town getting further developed? I mean, hell, look at West Milford. It's the largest township in the state of New Jersey. It's got everything. It's got Jungle Habitat, which closed down. It's got a movie theater, which closed down. Um, it's got a bowling alley which closed down, and it's also got 80 square miles of open land that the state will not build on because the state is run by idiots. I fucking love this town. But as it turns out, the residents aren't the only ones who want to save the mansion. Enter the ghostly trio, Stretch, Stinky, and Fatso. After getting a hold of the front loader and scaring off the driver, they do what they do best scare off the rest of the fleshies, and make a bunch of stupid puns doing so. I learned this trick from my mummy. <laughs> Move it, pal. <laughs> this is a no parking zone. You better check under there. Under where? Exactly. A mega onesie. <laughs> what a crack up. And don't you just love how the ghosts just float around like Adobe Premiere effects tacked onto the screen? That is some high quality animation. I told you you were eating too much dairy. Ghost free, flashes nothing. <laughs> anyway, let's get back to Chris. Unlike the other residents, he has a fascination with ghosts and everything supernatural. In fact, he's had a couple encounters with the ghostly trio before. Other than that, there really isn't much else to say about the kid except the fact that, well, he likes ghosts, he doesn't have a mom, and his dad is a douchebag who doesn't care for him. If we want to become invested in our main character, then giving us an annoying 11-year-old necromaniac isn't particularly dapper. But he does have some opponents in the form of a group of bullies led by Brock Lee. No, not Rock Lee. Brock! Oh, how I fucking wish. So, you off to another weirdo convention? Try dead rock. Check it out. Chris is reading about himself. <laughs> you guys really need new material. Shut up, geek girl. Pulverize you. Ah, people, run! Chris realizes that the ghostly trio are responsible for the anarchy, so he decides to pay them a visit. Hey, it's that Snoop again. Touch guys, but the wedgie it seemed a bit overused, don't you think? Who is you, nosy? Hmm, not sure if forced pun or really agitated behavior. Anyway, Chris wants to join their club, but he's rejected due to the fact that he's a fleshy and not a ghost. I know a lot about ghosts. Let me hang with you. Hang. You're a little late for that event, kid. Besides, us? Pals with a bone bag? Don't make me laugh. Don't make me puke. Don't eat beans around the campfire. <laughs> oh, yes. Keep the gags going, guys. They're totally not getting old in the slightest. Come on, guys. Beat 
it, biped. You don't scare right. Ghosts. What do they know? Well, they are dead. Certainly they know a lot. So remember that train that Casper was on from earlier? Well, as it turns out, it's headed to Ghost Central Station, where ghosts are taught how to exist in the undead world. One of the lackeys there is a dim-witted ghost named Snivel. And guess who he's voiced by? And welcome to our ghost train station. In other words, the station where we train you to be ghosts. Get it? Oh my god, it's a poly geist! Everybody, come on, what are you looking at? Move, I am Snivel, I told you, keep on moving. Well, march, march, march. You didn't laugh at my jokes. Gee, I wonder why. So as the other ghosts go to get their paychecks, Snivel discovers that Casper isn't there. This pisses off the Big Boo Kibosh, voiced by James Earl Jones. He fears that if a rookie ghost wanders aimlessly around the real world without any scare training, it'll be bad for business. How would it look if I, the mighty Kibosh, let some wide-eyed rookie run loose without any schooling? Very embarrassing, sir. Embarrassing? It's disgraceful. Ah! Almost as bad as losing track of those three worm-headed deservers. What were their names? Stinky Stretch and uh, Fat Soap, sir. When I find those slackers, I'll tie a sheep shank on their bed sheep butts. Your blood pressure is stupendous one. I have no blood! And you know, despite looking like Slimer on steroids, I have to say that Kibosh is actually pretty mean and intimidating. Plus, James Earl Jones does do a good job voicing him. In fact, just about all the voice actors in this movie do a good job. And that's mainly due to the voice cast we're given. Stretch is voiced by Jim Ward, Stinky by Bill Farmer, and Fatso by Jess Harnell. These guys have bags of experience, and they know how to have fun and be entertaining. In fact, why couldn't this have been just an all-CGI film? Oh yeah, that's right. They happened to release two CGI Casper movies after this. And guess what? They suck too! Back to the real world where we see Gutenberg with the town's mayor, played by the late comedy legend Rodney Dangerfield. Oh hey, he was in the first movie. Sort of. You think you got a tough? I got a facelift. There was one just like it underneath. Unfortunately, despite getting a pretty high billing in the credits, Dangerfield is only on screen for only a few scenes. Still, you gotta give Dangerfield some respect for trying with the material he's given. Ghost rumors have been coming into my office for the past month. Yes, Mr. Mayor, but most of them are prank calls. They're, they're kids, they're drunks, they're nutcases. My wife? And charming, intelligent women. Oh, my wife is very intelligent. It takes her an hour and a half to watch 60 Minutes. You know, it's very hard to call some events rumors when a grand majority of people are witnesses. Seriously, how many people saw the ghostly trio flying around causing mayhem? And how many more of them saw Casper running through the streets? Hell, one person got mummified, another got wedgied, and several more got covered in ghost goose. There's evidence everywhere! Chris, meanwhile, is still having bully problems, so his teacher, who happens to be Fistograph, tries to lend a rebellious hand. I know that Brock and his pals have been picking on you for some time. Oh, no big deal. They're losers. No, but you've got to stand up for your rights. You can't let people get away with that kind of nonsense. It's like Applegate Mansion. If we don't stand up for it, people are going to tear it down and build some new choking puke. So even though it's become clearly apparent that the mansion is haunted, you're still willing to save it just to make it a historic landmark? Oh yeah, I can see it now. Applegate Mansion, haunted by specters that spew boogers. Our first attempt was delayed by interference from a few... No ghosts. Right. Uh, militant reactionaries. Militant? No need to worry, though. The Deeds Town Rejuvenation Project will soon be back on track. Hey, Mr. Creep. Mr. That weasel! You can count on it. Well, Buster... I'm gonna have another rally, see? <laughs> you haven't heard the last of Sheila Fistograph! I don't even... So, of course, our two protagonists meet, and they learn that they both have a lot in common. Bet it's fly flying and vanishing? All I know is everybody just screams at me and runs away. Sounds pretty lonely. You don't know how lonely. Let me guess. You feel like no one's on your side, no one really cares about you. And no one really likes you.
Well, nobody wants to be a robot ghost occupied inside a human host, so Chris decides to take Casper to meet Stretch, Stinky, and Fatso. The ghosts themselves, having dropped out of the spook school, take this as an opportunity to show themselves that they can teach how to scare even better than Kibosh can. They teach Casper the basics, like how to turn invisible, how to fly, and how to go through walls. See the wall. I see the wall. Now, be the wall. I am the wall. Now, go through the wall. I am going through the wall. <laughs> That's what the public wants. No faces. Oh, I'm sure ghosts going through walls isn't hard to do. I mean, I saw Casper go through one earlier in that same scene. Great continuity. Unfortunately, Stimble manages to track the ghost down. Quite quickly, in fact. What is Deeds Town the first stop on the way? He reports all this to Kibosh, who takes it well. Ah! Oh! I'm sorry you played for one. How foolish of me. They're teaching Casper their own unorthodox, though, may I say, illegal, ghostly techniques. They hope to use Casper to put you in your place. Don't even say those. <laughs> I like that scene just because I like to see Polly Shore suffer. The ghosts try everything they can to make Casper scary, but after a whole day's work, they finally give up on him because he's just too much of a baby face to be scary. Back to Chris, who's still having daddy issues. He doesn't show up to the science fair and help Chris with his project because he's still focused on his own issues with the mansion and... <sighs> You know what? I'm sorry, but I just cannot get invested in this storyline because it's just so boring. I mean, what do you think of when you think of Casper the Ghost? Rallies? Science fairs? Steve Gutenberg? This doesn't feel like a movie about Casper. It just feels like some cheesy Disney movie mixed with Casper thrown in at the last second. Then the movie tries to give Chris a love interest in the form of Brock's friend Jennifer, but again, it's extremely downplayed and adds little to nothing to the story. So, Chris decides to give Casper a helping hand at being a ghost. Lesson one, going through walls. Hey, no problem. I've got that wire. Watch. Wait! <laughs> G-rated movie. <laughs> that was so not funny. So Chris takes Casper to the library and continues to teach him new things like changing shape and carrying books until Brock Lee shows up to bully him around some more. Don't you have some place to go? Like detention? Hey, come on guys, let's go. He's not bothering us. You think you're so smart, don't you, freak? Brock's talking to you, geek. Yeah, geek. Ooh, those zingers. They hurt so bad, it's like getting hit by pink fluffy unicorns dancing on rainbows. They say this library is haunted. By who? Ernest Huntingway? <laughs> no, William Shrike's boat. <laughs> this is some sort of trick, right? Darn right, he's messing with us. Really? Because it doesn't look like he's doing anything. So unless you think Chris is telepathic, well, then you're paranoid. Still, the scene where the fire extinguisher is strapped to his back spraying CO2 all over the place is pretty entertaining. It ends when Brock is launched right into the principal, who also happened to be the guy Casper scared in the bathroom. That's another person that Casper's been spotted by. The head of a school, no less. Hell, if I was Richard Maul here, I'd close the freaking school down and fumigate the place. Everyone in this movie is either paranoid or brain dead. 
Oh, and speaking of brain dead, we've saved the absolute worst performance for last. When Gutenberg can't find anybody else to demolish the house, he hires some weird war nut named Bill, played by Academy Award-nominated musician and comedian Michael McKeon. Now, McKeon has had quite a few good roles in his career. The man was spinal tap for crying out loud. But here, he pulls off this weird Joe Don Baker-esque performance that's so freaking sappy, it makes him seem like he's in a real lame SNL skit. Very few problems that can't be solved with a suitable application of high explosives. Tomorrow, that place will be bite size. Do you think you can put this out, please? Huh? Ah, oh, don't worry about that. Doesn't go boom without this. <laughs> See that? Harmless as a steak knife. Except one thing. What's that? My office is on fire! Hey! 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 Damage control! Drop and roll! The fire here! Aren't you trained in this? This is not Spinal Tap. This is Short Circuit 3. So now that Casper has learned everything he needs to know about being a ghost, he decides to test his skills out on a robber holding up a convenience store run by Sherman Hemsley. <laughs> How dare you not take a piece of that jerky! Wheezy made it special! While Chris and Casper reflect on how well they're doing, Fistograph shows up to drop off a book Chris left at the school. This leads to a series of hijinks where Chris is trying to hide Casper so Fistograph doesn't see him. Why does Chris have to do this? Casper knows how to turn invisible now. Just go into stealth mode or go in the other room. It's not that hard! Fistograph says she would have liked to have a discussion with Chris's dad over the mansion, but seeing as he isn't home, she decides to leave and prepare for the rally. Why? Why not wait until he actually does come home? And how do you know people will show up to this thing after what happened last time? Chances are they're at home constructing their own proton packs and ghost traps rather than making signs. And you should know! You were there! Later that night, we see McKeon crawling through the mansion, planning a bomb to blow the place up. And, of course, they just have to use the Mission Impossible theme during this. It's such a fine line between stupid and, and clever. Yeah, it's just clever. like a turnabout. See you manana, boys. Manana? Why not just blow the place up at noche while nobody's around? Oh yeah, that's right, because then we wouldn't have a climax. Gutenberg eventually does come home, and Chris tries to introduce him to Casper. But the ghostly trio, pissed off at Casper saving George Jefferson earlier, show up and take him away. Chris, I don't have time for games. It's not a game. Ghosts are real. Casper, Chris, come on. Stop. I know. He probably wanted the Applegate Mansion. Let's go. That Sheila Fistograph put you up to this, right? I'm going to have a talk with your principal about it. This is ridiculous. Why can't you believe me? Mom would have. That's it. You have an overactive imagination. It is time to grow up. You sure you're not looking into a mirror right now, Gutenberg? This goes. This and this. This. Look at this stuff. Those are mine! This is trash. Just like my career. Damn police academy. Fed up with his dad, and really, who wouldn't be, Chris decides to run away. But as he's walking down the streets, he's once again confronted by... <gasps> Brock Lee. You got me a month of detention, geek. I refrain what I said last time. Chris didn't do shit, Casper did. But then again, if I ever did get a month's worth of detention, I'd blame it on anybody. Jennifer tries to stop Brock, but after seeing that his girlfriend has turned on him, Brock pushes her aside and the bullies carry Chris to the Applegate Mansion, dropping endless amounts of lame insults as they go. They lock him up in a closet and leave him for dead. The next morning, the ghostly trio have given up searching for Casper, and to make matters worse, Kibosh and Snivel have shown up to Deedstown to catch them. They lock the ghosts up in a magical cage, and they go out to hunt Casper. Meanwhile, Gutenberg discovers that Chris isn't in his room, and that's not all he discovers. Chris, I'm sorry, last night wasn't my fault. Don't! 
<laughs> Greatest Gutenberg ghost reaction ever. Go! 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 Eventually, Gutenberg comes to his senses, and Casper tells him about how he doesn't care for his son and always cares about his work. The two then decide to go rescue Chris, who Casper says is at Applegate Mansion. I have no idea how he knows this, since he didn't see Chris until last night, but fuck logic, this movie is almost over. Gutenberg hitches a ride with someone who turns out to be Fistograph, and they make it over to the mansion, where people have surprisingly shown up. Gutenberg calls Bill to stop the count. Bill! Stop the detonator! At ease, soldier! Get out of my sector, you bleeding heart libertine! This mission is aborted! Stop! Bill. Bill, you freak! It's me, Tim! How do I know you're not some master of disguise imposter? What? Oh, eventually stopped when Fistograph slams her car into the tree, knocking him out and losing his controller. We did it! Negatory, you sniveling liberal pansies. My bomb's got a default mechanism on it. You can wave bye-bye to that rat trap in one minute. Well, technically two minutes, but this movie was made by monkeys, so who cares? Gutenberg manages to get Chris out of the mansion, and Casper decides the only way to stop the bomb is to eat it. Right as he does this, Kibosh enters. <laughs> now I got you. Defeated in a one-hit knockout. Why were you even in this movie? It may be haunted by ghosts, but it's still a part of our town's history. Respect this town. It gets no respect. How did you do that? They taught me, sir. We did? Uh, yeah, we did. Told you we had great techniques. Hmm. Then I was wrong to split you three up. A family as scary as you has my permission to haunt where you want. But you still need to go through basic training. Sorry, you can't take Casper. Yeah, you said yourself that you can't split up a family. But he's not related to you. Sure he <laughs> is. Don't you see the resemblance? We're, uh... He's, uh, uncles. <laughs> so, Kibosh leaves, and the ghostly trio head off to take care of the bullies, and they do all of this off-screen. That's right, folks. We got the best... The best! ...versus the beast, and we don't even get to see it. Lame. And so the movie ends with Gutenberg and Fistograph deciding to make the Applegate Mansion a haunted house. Chris introduces Casper to Jennifer, and we finish off with the world's greatest jump scare. <laughs> this movie is terrifyingly bad. Everything that made the original Casper creative is completely gone here. What we get instead is a boring, lifeless, generic, badly acted, badly written hunk of garbage. All the actors here deliver atrocious performances that range from dull to completely over the top. The only actors who do actually do a good job are the voice actors. And let me tell you, when Pauly Shore has one of the better performances in your movie, you know you're screwed. The villains are all next to useless, Bill is an inept dumbass, the bullies are as generic as you can possibly get, and while Kibosh does make a pretty intimidating villain, he doesn't even do anything in the final climax. Depressing. This movie could have had potential, but with bad acting, bad animation, bad story, and plot holes galore, there is absolutely no way I can recommend it. Hardcore headache for Casper, a spirited beginning. Now, will I ever review the sequel, Casper Meets Wendy? Hmm, maybe sometime next year. But this year, I want to actually review something good. So stay tuned next time as I finish off Hardcore Halloween with a review of The Halloween Tree. Peace out.
Hey, how do you think Brock Lesnar would react if he ever saw a ghost? Yeah!